which basically deals with the effect of an emergency. Our unit 98. Does everybody see that there? Yeah, there. Pretty good. All right. Our unit 98. While an emergency cannot create power and no emergency justifies the violation of any of the provisions of the United States Constitution or state constitutions, public emergencies such as economic depression, all right, I'll go over here to the next page. What happened here? All right. All right, let's go. For especially liberal construction of constitutional powers, and it has been declared that because of national ex exigency, it is the policy of the courts in times of national peril so liberally to construe the special powers vested in the chief executive as to sustain and effectuate the purpose thereof. And to that end, also more liberally to construe the constituted division and classification of the powers of the coordinate branches of the government, and insofar as may not be clearly inconsistent with the Constitution, right? In other words, it can't be in conflict with the Constitution to have extraordinary powers in the chief executive. But I'm telling you, on the other hand, a contention that a great emergency such as the Depression should permit the construction of the constitutional provisions which would meet the emergency was rejected. In one case, the court holding that neither the legislature nor any executive or judicial officer may disregard the provisions of the Constitution in cases of an emergency. Where the plain and unequivocal terms of the Constitution present to question of construction as to departures in emergencies. So not even an emergency justifies the taking away of constitutional provisions. And I know you've heard differently. I know you think, well, they got an emergency. They just declared an emergency. And then the president issues an executive order. But let me ask you, if it's a republic of the Constitution of the United States, isn't it law? No. Who says so? We do. We're the people. It's our country. I hope I'm not boring you to tears here, but it's kind of important that we cover these basic things so that you can understand. As to the construction ref with reference to the common law, an important canon of construction is that that constitutions must be construed with reference to the common law. That means the law of the little people out there, not the corporations. Okay? Since it, in most respects, the federal and state constitutions did not repudiate but cherish the established common law, this fact has been taken into consideration by the courts in construing certain clauses in a state constitution, such as the provisions securing the right to a jury trial. Also, provisions in regard to crimes have been interpreted with reference to the common law rule that one, that one charge for the crime may be convicted of a lesser offense necessarily included in the crime charge. In such cases, the courts of the state always regard the language in the common law sense. So the common law prevails. Don't let anybody tell you this admiralty law prevails because it only prevails if you get sucked into it. We're not going to let you do that. We're going to teach you how to beat it. The common law also permitted destruction of the abatement of nuisances by summary proceedings. Traffic tickets, folks. That's what a traffic ticket does. It is a writ of assistance, a bill of attainment. It's unlawful in the United States of America. And it was never supposed that a constitutional provision was intended to interfere with this established principle. And although there is no common law of the United States in the sense, who said so? Erie Railroad versus Tompkins. Okay? Here's another one of those. All right. Of a national customary law as distinguished from the common law of England adopted in the several states. In interpreting the federal constitution, recourse may still be had to the aid of the common law of England. It has been said that without reference to this common law, the language of the federal constitution could not be understood. So the common law applies, folks. And we're going to get into that common law heavily in the advanced section, all right? Now let's get back into this. In interpreting the federal constitution adopted by the several states, the recourse may still be had to the aid of the common law of England. It has been said that without reference to the common law, the language of the United States constitution would not be understood. This is due to the fact that this instrument and the plan of government of the United States were founded on the common law as established in England at the time of the revolution. 
Okay. Therefore, it is the general rule that the phrases in the Bill of Rights taken from the common law must be construed in reference to the latter. Specifically, the United States Supreme Court has taken the common law into consideration in construing the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment provisions relating. All right. So the common law is extremely important that we get, and we will cover that thoroughly. It's important to understand that most of you out there are citizens at the common law. That only, only those that understand the differences in admiralty and maritime law, those that are corporations, officers of corporations, or officers of government residing in the District of Columbia, the 14th Amendment duality of citizenship, which is talked about in the case of Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, which is a rather heavy argument. And I will cover that thoroughly with you so that you understand where the traps and the differences are. But right now, I'm trying to demonstrate to you construction and programming so that you can understand that this Constitution right here is the supreme law of the land, is a contract in writing, it is enforceable in favor of you, and an open court of law, you are the beneficiary. Okay? I want to give you some basic more points on this AM jurisprudence argument. This is section 114 of the 16th volume of AM jurisprudence section. I'm going to give you a couple more of these sites so that you can understand how powerful a document this is. Okay? Let's go to the next section, which is 115, which is the third. Let's see which one. 117. This is the Iger Series section. They're all sweating. By the way, I highly recommend you go down to the law library. Grab that 16th volume of AM jurisprudence. Start at section 1 and start paging through to section 300. You will absolutely be astounded. We're now in 16th AM jurisprudence, section 117. And I will read it to you. Basically, various facts and circumstances extrinsic to the Constitution are often resorted to by the courts to aid them in determining its meaning. As previously noted, however, such extrinsic aids may not be resorted to where the provision in the question is clear and unambiguous. In such a case, the courts must apply the terms of the Constitution as written. 